Oh, these masks. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Grace Point Fellowship. Great to see you here. If you're uh, joining us online, a special welcome to you as well. Uh, it is the first Sunday in Advent, and uh, we look forward to worshiping together and remembering uh, the season where we celebrate uh, God with us. Let's open our service in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for the, uh, the Christmas season where we remember uh, God with us. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. God, for the gospel, the good news uh, that God, you want to be with us. You have said from the beginning that it is your desire that you would be our God and we would be your people, that we would dwell together, that we would enjoy life together. And so right now, God, I pray for us that we would, even in these crazy circumstances in our world, that we would recognize that uh, for all who receive you, who believe in your name, you give the right to be part of your kingdom, and it's going to be a glorious kingdom. Uh, So right now, God, we just pray that we would have open hearts, open minds, open ears to hear from you today. May we lift our voices in praise. May we lift our prayers to you. And God, we know that you hear us. And we ask that you would speak to us, that you would, again, share the message of hope that you have for us. We thank you that you do love us so dearly. We thank you that uh, it is your desire that we would be in relationship together. So bless us now in this service, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good morning, everyone. If you have everyone uh, stand, and we'll continue with our worship. And the first couple songs we'll be singing is Awesome is the Lord Most High and Beautiful Name. And I know when we, especially in times like this, when we say our first song is Awesome is the Lord Most High, I know there's times, especially with the new restrictions, sometimes we don't feel like singing, Great are you, Lord, mighty in strength. But when we actually deeply look down and see that there's so much truth to that, you know, Great are you, Lord, because he is mighty in strength. He is always faithful. You are faithful. You will ever be, even amongst situations like God is continually working. We will praise you all of our days. I hope that is our worship here this morning, that amongst whatever is going on, we know that we can put our trust in God and say, we will praise you all of our days. And it's for your glory we offer everything. Again, let's all raise our voices. It earned inside, I guess we're all allowed to sing, but again, let's continue to worship, point our focus to God and say, God, you know, praise be your name, glory to you. So awesome is the Lord most high. Great are you, Lord, mighty in strength. You are faithful. You will ever be. We will praise you all of our days. It's for your glory, we offer everything. Raise your hands, all your nation.
Let's continue our worship with what a beautiful name.
Let's just uh, have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth in those words that were sung. What a powerful name yours is. What a wonderful name. Yours is the kingdom. We thank you, God, that though it might not appear to all eyes right now in the world, but God, you are building your kingdom. Jesus, you are already king. And to all that join you in that kingdom, to all those who receive you, who believe in your name, you give the right to become children of God. What a great gift. Thank you for the truth that we remember over the Christmas season that, God, you came to be with us. You came to teach us through your Son what you are really like. You came to tell people about your heart, that you long to forgive that you long to renew our relationship, that you want to give us to be at peace. You want us to be at peace with you, God, and that peace can only come through Jesus Christ. Thank you for that great gift. And God, right now we recognize that uh, it's, it's a world of turmoil. We recognize that uh, in an earthly way, things are not at peace right now. And God, we do want to pray uh, for those that are so affected by COVID. We pray for the sick right now. Uh, God, we know that there are uh, over 1,700 more people eat just in Alberta. Uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands across the world each day now, God, that are, are sick with uh, the coronavirus. God, we pray that you will intercede. We pray, God, that you will uh, show your power, that we will show uh, people, God, that you love, that you care, that you will intercede, bring healing. We pray, God, for those in our own congregation that are sick, that you'll bring healing into their life, into their bodies, God. God, even more, we pray for those uh, who don't know you, those who are struggling spiritual. God, we pray that you will reveal yourself to those people that need to hear from you, that are wondering if you're there. God, we want to thank you that uh, you are good. And that you work even in the difficult situations, situations in life. You work uh, out for our good, for the good of those who love you. And God, you promise, uh, you give us hope. You promise that there is a better kingdom to come. And we look forward to that. Thank you, God, for the way you have blessed our congregation, that you've taken care of us, uh, that you have uh, enabled us to keep our ministries going even in, uh, through the whole uh, uh, virus, the pandemic. And God, we just pray for your continued work in our lives. Uh, God, that you would uh, work in each of our hearts, that you would, uh, your Holy Spirit would prompt us, would, would reveal uh, your will, your word, uh, that you would give us encouragement, that you would share your love with us, uh, that you would give us exhortation when we need it. You would prompt us uh, to look around us and consider others. Help us, God, to be your hands and feet. Help us to look around and see the people in need. And God, I pray that we would be a church that responds with generosity, with care, with compassion. And so, God, in all these things, we turn them over to you, but we, we, I hope we say yes, that we will join with you, God, in your mission in your purpose, and your plan to reach out to the world, to, sh to give hope, to give a sure hope that a better kingdom is coming, and all who want to be part of it, well, they can. So we just pray you continue to teach us that and bless us during the rest of this service. We pray this in Jesus' name now. Amen. Well, uh, once again, welcome to uh, Grace Point Fellowship. Uh, right, right now, uh, we are going to ask uh, Matt Clausen if you want to come on up. Uh, of course, part of every church is, you know, we, we share the Word of God, we teach, we, we try to have a positive, you can just grab that mic right there and, and stand away from me so that uh, we don't infect each other. Mask on, Mask on yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and we participate in things around our city. And we want to have a ministry to people in our church and our community, but also God has said, go into all the world. And uh, uh, Matt Clausen is a friend of ours that uh, I think most of you know him. Uh, he has been involved at our, at our uh, Sunnyside camp uh, a few years ago. And uh, uh, right now, him and his family have been preparing to go overseas to Japan. And so we're going to ask him to share just a little interview now, uh, ask a few questions about his ministry and all that stuff. So uh, with that in mind, uh, 
Matt and his wife Marie graduated with degrees uh, from Ambrose, right, uh, just uh, back a few years ago. And in uh, 2016, they went over to do an internship in Japan. Uh, you were there for eight months, I believe. That's right. And uh, there they grew to like Japanese cuisine so much that they determined they have to go back permanently. And uh, so uh, why don't you tell us about that, Matt? Uh, tell us about uh, how that plan started. Go ahead. Just introduce yourself. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank uh, everyone here to taking this moment to hear our vision. Uh, we were so blessed to be a part of the Sunnyside Camp just three years ago after we went on internship to Japan and uh, we were able to bring Japanese students to that camp and see how they were transformed over that week hearing the gospel message and uh, yeah, we're just really excited to be continuing in ministry with Grace Point uh, even in the years to come. Well, why don't you tell us first of all, in what capacity are you going over? Tell us about the missions organization that you're going to be working with and what you'll be doing over in Japan with them. Yeah, so we'll be partnering with a mission called Sunrise International Ministries. They are a mission that is based uh, in Japan, and uh, we are looking forward to partnering with them. They, uh, the founding couple of Sunrise, have been doing ministry long-term in Japan. It's a couple by the name of Jim and Masako, and they have a really strong vision to make disciples, equip leaders, and in that way create a multiplying movement of churches across Japan. So we're really excited to be partnering with them. And particularly, our family will be going to Ome, which is in the western part of Tokyo. There is a ministry team there already that have been doing ministry for a number of years, and their ministry is growing. Uh, praise God. So we get to join them. Is that where you were when you were over there on uh, internship as well, or were you in a different area then? When we were there in 2016 and 2017, we were on the uh, east part of Tokyo, uh, right downtown in a little island community called Shiohama. Okay. Yeah. So in your, in your full-time ministry that you're going to now, uh, you know, what are the needs? What do, you, what do you see as the needs of Japan, and how do you plan on addressing those needs? Uh, yeah, thanks for asking. So for my wife and I, uh, right at the start when we were discerning our call overseas, um, God placed Japan in our hearts, and it really was a strong calling for us. And over the years, as we've been learning Japanese language and culture, uh, God has been showing us some of the needs that we can address as we go. So um, one of the first needs is Japan is, in the world, the largest homogenous, least reached people group. So of the 136 million souls in Japan, there is less than 2% who declare as Christian. So there is a need to go and share the gospel faithfully long term. Uh, as well, as we studied culture, there was this theme uh, that kept coming up as we talked to people in Japan while we were living there and people living here from Japan. And that theme was, uh, the word they used to describe the culture was samai. Uh, for those of you who know Japanese, samai is, uh, could be defined as narrow or confining. And so it was very interesting to us, as many people would describe their culture this way, uh, we felt that uh, we could see, as we learned more, uh, some of the symptoms of this Samai culture that has developed in Japan over the years. And one of those, um, for fathers particularly, you might be able to see up there, on average, uh, the Japanese fathers, a, a father in Japan will get 15 minutes per day with his children and less than two hours per week. Ouch. Yeah, 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 and that's because of the pressures in the workplace uh, to lo work long hours. Uh, as well, uh, last year a survey was done by the World Economic Forum that ranked Japan 121st out of 153 countries surveyed for gender equality. Uh, that's behind, just behind the United Arab Emirates. Wow. Uh, and lastly, uh, this one is really close to my heart. Um, Suicide is still a major concern in Japan. Uh, we all know about the tsunami in 2011, where 30,000 people lost their lives. Uh, that year, uh, 30,000 people took their own life. And so each year, there is this ongoing tragedy of suicide. And to this day, uh, suicide is the leading cause of death among men uh, 18 to 44. And among students aged 11 to 17, the rate of suicide is increasing. Um, so, uh, I guess a sense of hopelessness, I guess. Yes, yes, yeah. And so our family really hopes to address these needs, and particularly uh, we have been hurt uh, by suicide. We've lost a close family member that way, so we feel uniquely equipped to walk alongside families who are struggling in this way. So, so what is your vision for addressing, you know, these things about them being the least people, uh, re least reached people group, and dealing with this other stuff? You know, so what's your vision for how you can address these things? 
So over the past few months, as we've been here in Canada, uh, we've been able to meet online with our team in Ome, and they have been communicating uh, with the community there, and there has been a very clear ministry vision that's come to the forefront for us. So we, we hope to be focused on family ministry, and specifically with an emphasis on early education and discipleship. Uh, early education is something that the community in Ome has expressed a desire for. Uh, as I had previously said, and as you can see in Japan, there is a pressure that mounts early for kids in the school system. And in Ome, Ome particularly, there are students who are struggling to keep up with the high pressure. So there is a need that they've expressed for an alternative to that school system. So we hope to uh, cooperate and coordinate with local leaders and teachers to provide an after-school program that will be uh, pressure-releasing, not pressure-filled um, for those students. Uh, discipleship, of course, is also very important. We, uh, we see disciples as ones who are learning to hear the Father's voice, follow in obedience, and teach others to do the same by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we walk with God, uh, you can see in Matthew 11, Jesus promises that as we take his yoke, he promises it'll be easy and the burden will be light. And so we hope in that way to uh, see lives transformed through the, the work of discipleship. And uh, we've also seen from that time we spent in Japan what this can look like. So we were able on our internship to walk with a family who had just uh, had a turning point in their lives. The husband had had a major medical event from working uh, long, long hours for his company. And so he was in the hospital for a couple of weeks and his wife was at home with their young children. And they realized at that time that they needed to change the pattern of their lives and, and be living in a different way. And that's right when God brought us into their lives through a barbecue outreach event. Barbecues, yeah. I've always Very, said, barbecues a great ministry. That's right, yeah. And so it was really great, as, even as our family was navigating a new culture and a new language, they were able to uh, walk with us through that, and then we just were able to share, you know, why we were in Japan and about our faith and the way God had led us. And now that family has been baptized, and they are active in the leadership of a local congregation in Shiohama that is still ongoing. So that really for us is the vision to be continuing that kind of work and in Ome this time. Yeah, I mean, a great story of effective, effective discipleship and, and, uh, and outreach. That's great. Well, uh, uh, we can't go on forever here, but... Uh, uh, let's, uh, how can we as a church body, how can we help you reach your ministry um, assignment in Japan? How can, how can we uh, help, you, help you with your ministry? Thank you for asking. We uh, really appreciate just this opportunity to share our vision with each of you. And um, I hope that I was able to share the vision well. And I would invite you, uh, even for those of you at home, uh, but each of you in the congregation, I know this isn't usual, but if you would take out your phone, and even go to our personal blog. You can see the address up there, classensmeetjapan.com. We have a connection card on that website, and we would love to have you just connect with us through there. And when you sign up there, you will be getting our newsletter each month as we're preparing to go. And as well, once you've connected through, the, through that card, we would love to be in contact with you. Hopefully, once things settle down uh, with COVID, of course, we would love to meet with you over a coffee, get you, to treat you to a coffee, and to just hear your questions, um, to yeah, hear more about you personally, and how we can be praying for you, even as you're praying for us. When's the date that you hope to go over? So we've, we've learned to hold loosely to dates. Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, yeah. Particularly in this season. Yeah. But next summer, we are targeting a departure. Mm. Yeah, we, we feel that Tokyo may be opening up with the Olympics possibly still happening, so it might be the right time. Might be. Well, let's just join right now. I, I hope that you are all doing that. Get that down. ClawsonMeetJapan.com. Write that down, everyone. And just to help out even more, I'll send it to you all as well in an email. But uh, let's uh, just take a moment right now and let's pray for the Clawsons. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the way you have chosen to partner with us. Uh, what, what a great privilege that you've given us, not only to be part of your kingdom, but to be citizens of your kingdom and to be ambassadors for your kingdom. Thank you that uh, the Colossians are willing to do this and go over to Japan. Uh, God, we pray for Japan. We recognize that there are so many people there. Uh, perhaps the lowest reach uh, country, uh, one of the lowest reach in the entire world with uh, the good news of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. So, God, we pray for the Colossians as they prepare that you will, God, bring in the support that they need. But more than that, God, that you will prepare them in their spirits, 
uh, Holy Spirit, that you will uh, help them to be equipped, that you'll give them uh, a sustained passion to reach out uh, with the gospel, with the good news uh, to lost people in Japan. God, that you will give them more than uh, a desire to preach, but also that you would uh, help them to display the love of God through their actions, through their compassion, through their uh, love and serving the people that they're in contact with. We pray for these ministries that they're going to be involved in, the early childhood education, uh, the discipleship, the small groups. God, we pray that you just bless them, give them insight, give them creativity in reaching out to the people of Japan. Uh, lastly, God, we pray that even, even now you will go before them and you will uh, prepare hearts, you will soften hearts, uh, you will give people uh, dreams or give people ideas, God, that there's something more, that they need you, God. And uh, God, we just pray that you will just bless the Claussen's ministry. Uh, as well, we pray for their safety, that you keep them safe, uh, both from the uh, coronavirus, uh, them and their kids, keep them all uh, healthy as well as they prepare to leave. Uh, God, we just thank you for them. And God, I pray for our congregation that you will bring to our minds regularly uh, the Claussens, that we will pray for them and uh, support them as much as we can as you bring it to our hearts to do so. So thank you for them. Bless them and keep them. Prepare them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Let us pray. We're going to ask our worship team to come up. We're going to have uh, one more song uh, right now before we continue. So stand as we uh, sing one last song before Brian comes up for today's message. I just want to share this. Uh, it's great kind of just to see how God works, um, his spirit that just leads. You know, the song I picked already yesterday, but it kind of goes along with what Matt just shared, just with his heart of reaching the broken. Uh, reaching those that uh, don't have hope, you know, and um, I was just kind of going through the, f the first verse when I was just sitting there hearing you, you, uh, you share. The first one says, you know, the song is, Great Are You, Lord. It says, You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So again, it's just a great reminder of, you know, who we have our hope in. And it's in God who gives us that hope, gives us that peace, gives us that love. So let's continue to give God the praise that, and continue to lift up the Claussens as they make their trip to Japan and prepare. And again, that they could be that light, uh, sh share God's light to the people of Japan. And for us as well, here in Calgary, that wherever we are at, that we can, again, spread the love of Christ and, and shine his light through us. Oh, 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 oh,
have to remember to turn my uh, self on when I come up here. Well, thanks so much, uh, worship team. Uh, what, a, what a great truth. You know, every breath we have uh, comes from God. And uh, He's so worthy of our praise uh, because of that. Well, today is the first Sunday of Advent. And uh, our theme for it, it's really the best ever theme for the times that we live in. Uh, it's funny talking with various people uh, about what they're going through and the, the, maybe the greatest problem I see, see right now is that there seems to be a, a downward slide of hope. And it's something we need more than anything. Uh, talking to Dr. David Tano, our resident uh, psychiatrist in our church, uh, he said, yeah, there's more and more people in, uh, that are dealing with uh, you know, mental difficulties uh, because of COVID. There's more people that are depressed, uh, dealing with depression, a more severe depression, and all this stuff. And, and maybe to all of us, to lesser degrees, you know, we can, we can feel that way. And it, it's not just the worry about being sick, but it's uh, time spent not being able to see your loved ones. Uh, I've had, to be honest with you, I've had a really tough uh, week with my, with my parents. My mom's been in the hospital and, uh, of course, no visitors allowed to visit her uh, for the first little while and stuff like that. So you can't even walk in the door and, and stuff like that. But then my, my dad has dementia. And so uh, trying to help him and, and, you know, either myself or my sibling, we had to stay with my dad because my mom wasn't there. He can't be left alone and all that stuff. And, and it's so tough because to see my dad and my mom, uh, they're confused and they're worried and, and they have been this entire time with all the isolation, uh, not being able to see their, their kids, well, it's partly the kids, to be honest, it's mostly the grandkids uh, and stuff like that. But uh, it, it, it drains the spirit and it, and it makes things tough. Well, today, as we light the first candle of, uh, of Advent, we remember the hope that was promised the hope given through the coming of Jesus, King and Messiah. I want to read from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 and 6 and 7. And this is talking about a time, uh, a couple hundred years before Christ, where the people were in despair. The people of Israel were in despair because they had lost their kingdom. They were in exile. And then the prophet Isaiah says, says this to them. And try to, try to think of it in terms of now, though, because... The same hope that they were being given is the same hope that's given to us. Isaiah chapter 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of His government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over His kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And I love that last line there. We sometimes focus on the you know, unto us a son will be born, and, and that's true. But I love that last line that says, the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. All that God has promised us, all that he's talking about here, it will be brought about. Why? Because of the zeal of God Almighty. What does that mean? Uh, what's that zeal for? You know, we, we talk about having a zest for life, a zeal for life. Uh, we talk about somebody being zealous. Uh, it means you really love something. You really are are committed to something. And for God, he's committed to bringing us back into a place of peace with himself. He's zealous of being in relationship again with us, him being our God and we being his people. And so back then, uh, hundreds of years before the coming of Christ, he spoke through the prophet to give the people of that time hope. And as we have lit this candle now, as we go through the coming weeks, we remember that God sent His Son to bring us hope. Let's pray together. Lord, so many of our problems stem 
from not remembering you, what you have done for us, the hope that you bring. We forget your wisdom, and so we worry. We forget your grace, and so we get complacent. We forget your mercy, and so we get resentful of others. But most of all, God, we forget the hope that we have in you and you alone. Hope for a better future, not just better, but great, amazing, a future of peace and prosperity, a future of health and joy, friendship and family, a hope of living in your kingdom where you will be the wonderful counselor, everlasting father, prince of peace. You who call yourself our friend will be king. And so God, help us to remember that it is a sure hope that we have. Your zeal will bring it about. You have said that in this world we will have troubles. But thank you, Jesus, that you have overcome the world. You have conquered death. And your kingdom is being built up. And soon it will fully be realized. And you will wipe away every tear. In this season, this Advent season, help us to remember that your birth brought hope. That you, God, took on flesh and came to dwell among us. And you gave your life for us so that we could gain forgiveness, peace with God, and life in your kingdom. May we remember hope this Christmas season. May we spread that hope to the people around us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our text this morning continues with that story of hope. We've been looking at Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, we are on now. And uh, last week we talked about uh, that message, how, how Jesus' own, own father, uh, Joseph, was unsure about things, but an angel appeared and said that, yes, you can trust us. And we move on now into Matthew, into chapter 2, and, we, and Jesus, uh, the story of Jesus and the hope that he brings continues. And so we want to start with that now, uh, Matthew chapter 2, and it's the story of the wise men. The story of the wise men, the Magi visiting the Messiah. Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him. Well, I think the first thing to take note of here, uh, as you can see, Matthew has skipped over most of the details about the birth of Jesus. He left that to Luke. But he continues on with a story focusing on Jesus' kingship. And the first thing that we see here is a conflict between two kingdoms. Jesus' kingdom and earthly kingdoms, in this case, represented by King Herod. And so King Herod at the time was the king over Palestine, the king over that area. And he hears that these wise men, these magi, have come from another country. So, I mean, they're practically royal themselves. They're important people from another country. And here they come to Jerusalem, and they make, they're not quiet about it. They're not being secretive or anything. They're asking people, where is the king who is to be born? Where is the one who is to be born king of the Jews? And as word got to Herod, he became worried because he's thinking, what's this? Somebody else is going to be born king? And he was worried about not only his own kingship, but maybe his own son, who he thought would be king after him. And so we see a conflict between earthly kingdom and the kingdom uh, that Jesus is bringing about. He's disturbed, it says, and it wasn't because he wanted to go worship Jesus too, but because he saw Jesus as a threat to his own kingship. And notice it says that not only was Herod disturbed, but it says all Jerusalem with him. And I kind of thought about this, well, why would everybody else be disturbed about that? And I thought, well, disturbed doesn't always mean the same thing. I'm sure there were some people that were disturbed along with Herod because they're supporters of Herod. Oh no, what's this going to mean to Herod and his kingship? But I'm sure there were others that were disturbed for just selfish reasons. Oh no, 
more turmoil, more conflict. And then there was probably a third group that were probably disturbed. Those that were thinking, wow, could this finally be? Because we can be disturbed in a good way, right? Something can disturb us and something can come to our attention. And I'm sure there were those that were thinking, could this finally be the Messiah, our King, who would deliver us from our enemies? The presence of the King among us, it can be a disturbing thing, right? It's the same in our lives. The presence of God in our lives can be a disturbing thing. And we see this all around us. Some people want to just say, no, no, religion, keep it, you know, the, the old separation of, of, of religion from state. And they, they just want to shut out religion. And there's a lot of people like that. They just want to shut it out. Yeah, it, it's not my thing. For many people prefer to live their lives without acknowledging God, a king, the creator and savior. His presence can be disturbing because it forces us to take a side. What are we going to do with Jesus, the king? Herod chose his side to oppose. The wise men chose their side to seek, to seek and eventually to worship. And the message for us here is that we need to choose as well. How are we going to respond to Jesus' kingship? Oppose, ignore, or are we going to seek out Jesus? Are we going to receive and give the king our allegiance? Then we go on with our text and it says, When he had called together, that's Herod, when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where is the Messiah? Where was the Messiah to be born? They didn't have to look it up. They all knew. They all knew the prophecies. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. And then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for this child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Now Herod here is being, of course, a little bit deceitful. He wants to know where the child is for very uh, nefarious reasons. Uh, Of course, he wants to stop the kingship of Jesus. The text continues. After they heard the king, the wise men, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Everything in this passage is about kingship. Bethlehem is mentioned from the prophecy in Micah chapter 5 too that's talking about that a future king of Israel will come out of Bethlehem. We have Herod the king, the opposing king. We have the wise men. And in ancient, these ancient cultures, there's obviously a fine line between those who have spiritual authority, insight and power, and those who have political authority. They're representatives of another country, another king. Jesus, the king of the Jews, from the royal line of David. And even the star itself was often in this ancient world, uh, had a connection to royalty. And then we find that the wise men, when they come and see Jesus, their response, they worshipped him as king. They brought treasures fit for a king. And so Jesus is presented as both a king in conflict with Israel's present king, and a king recognized by the ruler of other nations. I think that's so interesting that the local king, I mean, Jesus is supposed to be the Messiah of Israel, but the king of that day was in opposition. But even a foreign country, foreign king's representative, recognized him as the king. And their response was what? To They bowed down, they, they knelt down, and they worshipped him, and they brought him gifts. And it brings us to that same choice about what kingdom we wish to be a part of. You know, and that's, that's the, 
that, that's the crux, that's the apex for us of, of our dis- decision is what kingdom do we want to be a part of? You know, in some ways, the kingdom of this world that Herod represents, it can seem like a really great thing, right? Because we have freedom, and that's what people really long for. That's why people rejected God right in the very beginning of, of hum- humanity's relationship with God. It's all about freedom. They want freedom. They want to make up their mind. And for us to choose the kingdom of this world, it, it seems to give us more choice. It seems to give us more freedom to choose, well, I'm going to do what I want to be, what I want to do. I, I kind of question whether it really does give us that freedom. Everybody's got to serve somebody. One of my a great Bob Dylan song. Uh, everybody's got to serve someone. And the truth of the matter is, if we don't want to serve God in his kingdom, well, we're serving kings, politicians. In this, in this world, we're bowing down, we're bending to the desires of those in power. We're bending or bending our own morals, our own ethics, our own lifestyle according to the loudest voices in our own system, whether they're right or wrong. It seems to be the way it works in our world, right? Whoever makes the most noise, that's who the politicians listen to. And so I question, and I ask you to question, is it really giving you more freedom not to be part of God's kingdom? In fact, Jesus said he came to give us freedom. And I don't know about you. I know probably many of you are the same as me. I I have felt so much more free bending my knee and saying, yeah, God, I want to be part of your kingdom. I find so much more freedom in that way. To those represented by the wise men who are honestly seeking, they're seeking, they find what they're looking for, the king. And look at the response. On coming to the house, it says, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So after seeking and finding, they worshipped him. They presented him with what they had. And that's what God asks of us. That we seek him, and when we find him, yeah, he does desire our worship. He is owed our worship. And sometimes people have a problem with that. I don't know why. We're so quick to jump on the worship bandwagon, worshiping our favorite sports team. Any of you that have been to the Saddle Dome uh, during the playoffs, not even during the playoffs, you see people rise from their seats and, ah, yay, 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 flames. <laughs> we worship hockey players. We worship celebrities. We worship all sorts of things. To worship is just to declare the glory of, to declare the worthiness. And yeah, when somebody scores a lot of goals, yeah, I guess it's okay to declare, yeah, they're a good hockey player. <laughs> That's the, the, the worship they're due. Yay, you're a fine hockey player. <laughs> good for you. Well, what does God deserve? He created the universe. He gave us life. He sent his son to die for us. God took on flesh himself and lived among us to teach us about his love He came to give us hope. He came to bring about a kingdom of peace, a kingdom where uh, the Bible says that there will be no more pain, no more suffering. Wow. Let's just give the due, the worship that is due him. That's what the the, uh, wise men did. They gave what they had then. They gave what they had. They gave, they brought gifts of gold and, and frankincense and myrrh. What gifts do we have to bring? God has said that. He's not... He's not concerned about our money. He's concerned that we participate with him, that we give what we have. And finally, uh, I love it that not only did they give their gifts, but they gave their allegiance. They gave protection. Do you like that? I love how at the end, uh, Herod said, come back and tell me so I can worship too. They knew that Herod was lying. They were told that Herod was lying. And they went home another way to protect God's son. And you know, and that's the other way that we can honor and give our allegiance to God is by protecting His name, by honoring His name, by standing up for Him. The Bible says, always be prepared to give reasons. And you know what that is? Yeah, it's uh, as Dan uh, Kamori and I have been talking about lately, lately. It's, yeah, it's understanding reasons for the faith. But even more than that, it's knowing our faith. 
to being able to tell people, hey, uh, this is what Christ has done for us. This is why I believe. This is why I've bowed my knee to the king, because he's giving me hope. And so the question for us now is how will we respond? That's the message that we have right now as we look to this next month as being a time of hope. I ask you all to consider, are we going to respond like Herod and protect what we see as our own freedom, our own desires, or are we going to choose the way of the wise men to seek him with our hearts, to bow down, to worship, to bring our gifts because he deserves them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for this message from Matthew where we see these, these wise men, these magi from another country coming to seek the King of Kings. It, it, it's a wonder to me, God, how they knew who he was. God, uh, but you and your wisdom revealed it to them and they sought the King. God, I pray that that will be on all of our hearts, that we will seek Jesus because he is the one who brings us hope. In all the circumstances of this life that we can't control, the one thing that we can do is give our allegiance to that king because we know that no matter what happens in this life, that he has conquered death and he has promised to give us a sure hope that will be culminated in his kingdom. A kingdom of joy and peace and prosperity and great friendships and family forever and ever. That is our choice. I pray, God, during this Christmas season, we will hold on to hope. And not only that we will hold on to it in our own hearts, but we will spread that message of hope to those that are in despair, to those that are hopeless. God, you have given us a message of hope. Help us to share it as well. We thank you, God, that you have given us Jesus Christ, that, God, you took on flesh to teach us about what it means to have a king who genuinely cares for his people, who loves his people. You lay down your life for us, and we thank you for that. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, God bless you all. Have a safe week. We are dismissed now.